Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Finance Minister Pravin Gordon delivered the 2014 budget speech this week. Terence Creamer joins me to talk about some of the highlights. Hi Terence. Hi. The budget speech seems to have been one of a uh, few surprises. Did any jump out at you? I think the only surprise is how few surprises there were, but, but seriously is that, you know, he held the line. And I think actually he did better than the line, in this, especially in the sense of the budget deficits. And I think that was a big focus, especially last year when we saw that there was a delay in the consolidation agenda of, on the fiscus. And there was concern from the rating agencies that maybe things were slipping out of control. And we're in an election year, so there was a view that maybe the minister would be forced to make additional expenditure in the run-up to the election to try and sort out some of the issues around service delivery protests or, you know, to pander to some of the populist feeling out there. And he certainly didn't do that. So it wasn't an election budget. He reinforced a number of themes, the key theme being that there's going to be an expenditure ceiling over the next three years, um, and we're going to sustain that expenditure ceiling, notwithstanding, you know, the, the pressures uh, for, from a number of sections of society for more money to flow. And, um, and we're going to consolidate that budget deficit. Already this year, the projection is that it's going to be 4%, which is 0.2% uh, better than what was projected in October last year. And it's going to continue that declining trend. And that, that is quite important because the deficit means uh, that you're spending more than you, you're earning in, in, in tax revenue. So you're having to raise um, debt to finance the balance. That debt is sometimes dollar, dollar denominated, sometimes rand denominated. And the interest payment on that debt is becoming a major line item on the budget. So we all know about the big ticket items such as education and wages and salaries for public servants and the health budget. But actually the interest payment line is becoming quite significant too. So I think you know, the fact that we're going to rein in the budget deficit means that we're going to have to uh, do less dipping into the capital markets, domestic and foreign, and therefore we can live better within our means. And therefore I think the message was really we need to uh, cut our cloth to what we have. Uh, we have a fairly good, robust revenue base, but it's not growing rapidly in the current economic climate. And it's not going to grow if the economy is only, to, only going, to, well, it was projected yesterday, uh, this week, that it's going to grow at 2.7% which is really far from shooting the lights out and far from where the National Development Plan's aspiration of 5.4% wants to take us. So we're not going to have massive revenue growth until we start growing this economy. So we have to you know, tailor our, our budget and our spending to that reality. And there's only so much uh, we can do in terms of uh, raising more revenue and raising more debt. And uh, really the, the other big theme is about polishing the way we spend and making sure that when we procure we get value for money. That is a, a theme that was emphasized uh, in the medium term budget policy framework. But I think major flesh was added to those bones in this 2014 budget in the sense that we were able to get so a sense of you know, the, the, the sort of capital scrubbing that's going on. So there's proper expenditure reviews now into key sectors. Um, I think the big one is looking at the 200 billion we're currently spending on education and looking seriously deeply at whether th that money is delivering value and how we can ensure that when we, uh, when we spend that sort of money on, a, on an important item like education, we start getting the results that we, we need as a country because those, those results are all about our future growth and our future development and our future sustainability because without strong education, and without strong skills development, we're going to battle to be the innovative economy that we have to be, the dynamic economy that we have to be to compete in a very fast-changing world. And the theme of implementing the National Development Plan seems to have been one that was stressed in the budget speech. It was. I think, again, you know, there was concern about whether this National Development Plan was just a piece of paper and nothing more. And I think over the last, since last budget in the national, uh, in the uh, mini budget in October, we've seen again um, flesh being added to the national development plan and, and looking at how we're going to implement the plan. So it was really, uh, the, th the big message was it's now we're turning our attention from 
the plan and the vision, uh, which is still contested and not, not liked by us, very uh, and key important sectors of society, most notably members of the, the labor movement. Um, and, uh, but, but we need to start moving towards the two key themes of implementation and action. And uh, there was quite a lot in the, not necessarily in the budget address, but in the supporting documentation, the budget review, around how some of those actions and priorities outlined in the National Development Plan are actually being budgeted for and being acted upon. And I think that will give business some solace, it will give the international community some solace, because on the whole it is supported by business and by foreign investors, and they feel that the vision is, is sensible. It's about really, the main theme really of that is to deal with this triple scourge of poverty, inequality, and unemployment in a way that's you know, um, sensible, in a way that's not populist, that, that you, know, can't, uh, you, you can't rise to the occasion you know, after the first one hit wonder, you know, so the money, um, uh, money needs to be sen spent sensibly over a period of time. Uh, there has to be value for money and there has to be a partnership between the different social actors in delivering the, the many millions of jobs that we're going to need by 2030 to getting back to growth levels of around that 5.4%, which is the aspirational target, and to really more and more addressing this big problem of inequality in society which is becoming a real risk, not only to our, our social stability in South Africa, but also to our future economic growth. And what do you think citizens and business should take away from Provin Gordon's national budget? Well, I think it's really, uh, I think what he reminded us was that he's presided over a difficult period, uh, a once in 70 year sort of e economic um, catastrophe in the form of that, uh, the recession that hit the world. And uh, I think that we have navigated through it I in a way. I think the, the, the phases that, w that we've used to get through this period, the first phase was very much about using the fiscal space that was created during the Trevor Manual years and applying that very urgently to try and keep us from dipping deeper into recession than, than we did in 2009. We went into recession, lost a million jobs. But without that sort of fiscal stimulus, it could have been a lot worse. The second step was really to use what we could from the uh, monetary authorities. Uh, so it was really about our Reserve Bank keeping our interest rates as low as possible for as long as possible. We see that's now got to the end, uh, stretched to the limit. So on both the fiscal side, I think we've seen that we reached our limit now, that we're working a very tight corridor on our fiscal resources. In fact, we have to start cutting back our budget deficit. We have to start in over the longer term, rebuilding that fiscal space that Trevor Manuel once left us with, so that when the next crisis arises that we can dip back into those fiscal resources. We've got reached the limit, I think, in terms of monetary policy, um, in terms of keeping the interest rates lower for longer. It looks like we're on a rising interest rate trajectory. So the next big theme and takeaway that people should get is that it's really going to be about the private sector. And the private sector playing its role I in, in the growth and recovery story. Now that's easier said than done when you don't really control the levers as government, but the key lever is confidence. And I think that yes, th uh, this, this week's budget was important in, in, in re-establishing that we not not a place that's just going to blow with the latest fashion and the populist winds, but that we have a solid base from government, but we've done what we can. And we'll continue, uh, I think, uh, probably in Gordon Mary Clare, we'll continue to disperse the social wage, which is uh, up to 57, nearly 60% of the budget in the form of social grants and public transport, etc. So that there is, there is the support for the poorest and most vulnerable of society. And there, is some res there are some resources available to stimulate growth in the economy and stimulate business. And I think one of the surprises of the budget, going back to the first question, was the, the, the sort of flexibility being shown around small business and some of the tax reforms being proposed there. Some of it's already been agreed upon, some is still being considered, but I think we're seeing that we, re, a realization around the importance of le releasing the burden, re lowering the red tape around small business to get that entrepreneurial activity uh, unencumbered, as as unencumbered as possible so that society can use that lever, that important jobs lever and growth lever in future 
in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. So it's, so it's really now, I think the next step is about unlocking the private sector's bal uh, balance sheet. So we've used, the, we've used the balance sheet of the country through the fiscal resources and the fiscal stimulus. We used the, the balance sheet of the Reserve Bank or the monetary policy through the low interest rates. We now have to try and find a way of unlocking the balance sheets of the private sector uh, through investment, especially job-rich investment. That's, and as I said, it's far easier said than done. And the key issue is about really trying to rebuild the confidence and rebuild a partnership in civil society that you know really deals with the real constraints to investment. And that re requires, in some ways, what uh, government is supporting through its state owned enterprises, the, uh, the public infrastructure drive so that uh, logistics and power aren't a constraint to investment. But it also requires some sort of meeting of minds around the other key supply side constraint, and that is the uh, labor volatility, the labor market volatility, the ongoing strikes. We sit here with the platinum strike continuing to stretch out and costing billions. And we need to send a signal that we, need, we uh, can find some sort of what Pravin Gordon spoke about, a social compact, a coming together where we all compromise in some way so that we can create the uh, basis for job-rich investment and for unlocking the money that is sitting on many private ba uh, balance sheets to start going into uh, investments that will grow this economy, create jobs, and ultimately that job creation is important, the most important lever in reducing this very, very worrying scourge of inequality. Thanks, Terence. That is the second Tech Show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.